my image out, my video feed out if it starts to wake up and give precedence to the eyes themselves. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, this is a, a subject that's very dear to me, San Francisco's historical flora. I spent many years pouring through um, Howell, Raven, and Rubsoff's Flora of San Francisco and worked back through Catherine Brandage's um, 19, 1896 catalog of plants and back to work, working chronologically backwards to Hans Baer and Botany of California. Um, that was before um, CalFlora and before the online uh, access to uh, the Consortium of California Herbaria was uh, readily available. So th this is um, what I'll be presenting tonight is kind of a, a biased distillation of some of what I think were Hans Baer's um, favorite subjects based on his writings in some of the proceedings from California Academy of Sciences, where he contributed a lot, and um, also some of his key articles, uh, Botanical Reminiscences, two-part series written over um, some years in the late 1890s, published in Zoe, an extinct but biological journal, and Erythria, which is also an extinct biological journal about extinct plants. <laughs> um, and uh, he also, of course, wrote the flora of the vicinity of uh, the vicinity of San Francisco, which was not a San Francisco flora, but like um, Eberly Green's uh, flora or manual of uh, vascular plants, except grasses. Um, it was Bay Area wide, and in some cases they had specific localities for San Francisco. But Hans Hans Baer was um, distinct among them in that he was really the only full-time resident old rush botanist in San Francisco. So he was an eyewitness to the earliest rapid transformation of the landscape. Um, I'll show some old U.S. Coast survey maps, topographic maps, and I won't show them in sequence because that's not the focus, but the rate of change, the spread of urbanization of San Francisco between Bear's arrival in 1850, the next updated topographic map in the late 1850s, and then the subsequent uh, revision in 1869, it's very similar to the 1970s development all around the Bay Area. Um, it was pretty rampant. So he was seeing the last fleeting glimpses of vegetation types that are nowhere in San Francisco today. And um, when you try to crosswalk extinct vegetation types to the modern ones, we, we tend to see things you know, retrospectively through what we're familiar with. So we want to match things to what we know. Well, my hypothesis, I hope I'll win over some converts, is that a lot of the most exciting vegetation that Bear described at length in his reminiscences really have no local counterparts left um, in San Francisco or the peninsula, but they do have fairly close analogs in terms of species composition and also geomorphology and hydrology further up the coast uh, between Point Reyes and Mendocino County in particular. And that's why my subtitle is a reassessment of his botanical observation from an expatriate San Franciscan's North Coast perspective. Um, I, I think I'm walking through in some of the, the older remnant dune systems here on the North Coast in Mendocino, particularly, but also at uh, parts of Point Reyes, some fairly close analogs of what um, Bear was writing about in um, what's now the mission. Um, well, anyway, I'm already delaying on my first slide. <laughs> um, I think Bear really deserves, uh, would deserve uh, a, a full talk just on his biography. I'm going to do him a disservice by just zooming through um, his rich life. Um, as I mentioned, he's the first re full-time resident San Francisco botanist. There were other visiting botanists like um, Henry Bolander, and um, there were other botanists who were active, but he was a full-time resident and actually was tied to San Francisco from his medical practice. Um, he was also an entomologist, an anthropologist all over the world, um, medical doctor. He was a novelist, satirist, writer, humorist, and a social reformer and activist. And that's worth a presentation in and of itself. Um, you know, I have a little envy that earlier generations of San Francisco botanists actually knew Peter Raven or Pete Rubstoff or, or um, uh, John Thomas Howell, but uh, 
as his friends and mentors, uh, some of the luminary naturalists of the 19th century, including Alexander von Humboldt. So um, he, he comes from a, an, an incredibly rich cultural and scientific legacy. Um, he botanized all over the world, um, particularly climates that had some affinities with uh, California and Australia and South Africa, but also in the Philippines, um, where he did entomological work as well. Uh, he was one of the first members of California Academy of Sciences, and he was, uh, until he left briefly for Europe in, I think, 1853 or 54, um, he was continuously present during the first years of San Francisco development, and you will see that reflected in some of the highlights of some of the rapid vegetation changes he saw, both with native and non-native species. So um, there are some publications on his life. Um, I'm not doing service in this, you know, bulletized version of his life, but uh, he's really worth in investigating and I, I wish I knew him. Well, uh, I'm going to pick from some of his favorite anecdotes in botanical reminiscences. So uh, these are things he's actually written about. I just wanted to do it in a more vivid show and tell version than his, um, his publications. Uh, he got to witness some really early in rapid invasions of non-native species that correlated with rapid environmental change associated with urban development of um, what was originally San Francisco was just the, um, the eastern part of the city. The western lands were not at that time considered part of San Francisco. They were just in the vicinity. So Richmond, Sunset, that was all left out. Um, when he arrived, he, um, he uh, made excursions into wetland complexes around what's now Mission Creek. Um, it was not entirely tidal, even though it was continuous with tidal sloughs. I'll go on about that shortly. Um, but in some of the wetland uh, complexes from Mission Creek and, and nearby drowned valleys connected to the tides, when he first arrived, he found peatlands that had uh, drain drainage patterns, which he described as rivulets, that were covered with mats of azola. Um, he had a different species name, but it's azola, it's our azola folliculoides. If you know azola today, it's a uh, native water fern. It's widely distributed in, in North America and elsewhere. Um, it forms mats over open water surfaces, and he referred to it as a deceptive vegetation. In some cases, it covered um, dry, not dry ground, but emergent wetlands that had been clothed in mats of azola that were left behind as water drew down uh, with water level fluctuations. And in some cases, it, it uh, covered actual open water and gave the appearance of a false surface, like the example shown here. Um, within um, three years from the runoff of urbanized San Francisco, these clear water then peatland and fen-like areas, with perfectly lucid water, um, lost all of their azola. And azola, if you know it from like Rodeo Lagoon or um, from uh, some of the other coastal lagoons in the area like Abbott's Lagoon, uh, it, it's rampant. It, it behaves like an invasive species, but it was completely replaced by what I would infer is the aquatic form of uh, cotula, cornopifolia. Uh, a, a common name even back then was brass buttons. We all know it from its brightly colored version when marshes are emergent, but um, cotula grows underwater. It can grow under full feet of water. It looks like a grass. Uh, it's typical heterophilus um, form of many aquatic plants. They have an aquatic morphology and then a terrestrial morphology. So we know the flowering terrestrial form with, with uh, lobed leaves. Um, Apparently, both forms completely took over the net drainage networks of these wetlands in what's now the mission. Uh, he watched that in a matter of three years. So that really is similar to the pace of invasive species we've watched enter San Francisco Bay wetlands in the last 30 years. I won't go on to all the invasive species here, but they, they move very rapidly in the space of a few years. They make huge jumps. and. Um, uh, he, he witnessed the first, the first one within the historic period after statehood. Um, here's an anomaly for an, an early invasive species stories, a story. Um, again, Bear wrote extensively uh, in dialogue with other botanists of the day regarding what was native and what was non-native. And they had a few species that were introduced during their stay, but there was a lot of controversy 
uh, in California Academy proceedings back and forth about whether species were early introductions before the historic period, documentation by botanists, and what was um, uh, naturalized and what was native. And here's an anomaly. This tells me a little bit about the way, I think it tells me the way Bear botanized and what his limitations were. Um, he was here during the entire transformation of Golden Gate Park and what's now the Outer Sunset and the Outer Richmond and the Presidio. Um, there's a book by uh, McLaren, James McLaren, uh, who was the first park superintendent of Golden Gate Park, and he um, gave an account of the early introduction by a cooperative venture by the military at the Presidio and uh, the park superintendent in San Francisco to stabilize dunes using imported Amophila arenaria, marum grass or European beach grass. Um, so he was there for the whole, that, that whole uh, massive transformation of one of the largest ecosystems in San Francisco, although then it was west of the city proper. Um, yet in his 19, uh, 1888 flora of San Francisco and its vicinity, there's no reference to Amophila or any of its archaic synonyms like uh, rundo or well, I mean, there, there are other 19th century words for it, but there is a reference to Elemus arenarius, which is the European species of Elemus that corresponds with our familiar Lanus mollus. And he described it as leaves pungent, pungent, like stiff, at the cliff house introduced, not native, under the name Esparto grass to keep the sand dunes from moving. Well, that's Kind of a contradiction because we know that, well, unless they're talking about the European Elemis arenarius, which was not distinguished from Mollus until another century, um, he's describing Amophila. Um, and we have good documentation that Amophila was introduced. And it, if you look online at pictures of what's called the several species that are called um, Esparto grass, they share the, the common name. Um, they look a lot like Amophila in aspect, and all of them are textile plants. They're used for um, making uh, thatch roofs and, and mats, and it's a, it's a, they're all tough grasses. So I think this is a mistake in identity. Um, it makes me wonder whether, like Green, uh, who I just slightly followed his era of botany, Green's uh, manual of, of plants in the San Francisco Bay Area left out all grasses. <laughs> he just didn't just didn't do them. Didn't like grasses. And um, I think uh, Bear may have just used what was available from Botany of California, uh, Watson's uh, Brewer and Watson, um, 1880, also around the same time, 1880. Um, but I don't think he, he um, ventured out to the western part of the peninsula very often. There, of course, there was no 38 Geary, there, is, no, there are no good roads out there. And um, uh, he, he seemed not to be interested in grasses, but um, I, I, I have no other explanation for why he could not distinguish these two grasses and, and conflated them. Um, it was very clear from Brandegee's catalog that, um, and, and other sources that Amophila was there. Um, so that's one anomaly. Uh, another uh, early invasion that he um, documented was what he called atroplex patulum, which is a misnomer for atro atroplex um, patula, which has later been reclassified through a series of taxonomic mishaps to atroplex prostrata, which is definitely non-native. So he was correct. This is a, an introduced European species. Um, there was a brief period in one of the Jepsons where they confused it with the native species, which is not true. Um, but what was interesting is the description. He described it as from cultivated grounds only, and he identified this, like many other of his um, non-native species that he discussed, as a ballast weed. In other words, it was clustered around shipyards or nearby cultivated grounds. Well, uh, it was written in his 88 publication, but most of that bot field botany was done in the decades earlier. Um, Green's 1888 manual described uh, atroplex patula as very common in marsh beaches near locality going to Petaluma and Vallejo. So it had already spread by the 1880s all through San Francisco Bay. But uh, Bear identified it as an initial introduction, basically near, near a port uh, in San Francisco. 
So those are two um, that are still with us. Uh, Atroplex uh, prostrata, fat hen or um, spear scale or orake um, is still widespread all through tidal marshes in the San Francisco Bay Area, as is its associated weedy, not particularly invasive, but somewhat invasive cotula cornopifolia. Okay, well, those are just two, three non-native species. Um, Bayer also got to witness some uh, really remarkable early extinctions. Um, many of these extinctions were in um, distinct geologic formations that happened to be right in the way of some of the earliest ex-urban expansions of San Francisco that expanded the city and, and grew over and removed elements of our flora that we really associate with, um, in this case, with Waithia. Um, Helenoides with um, uh, foothill grasslands well to the north, um, out, outside of the coastal prairie that we associate with most of San Francisco. Uh, this is an example from northwestern Sonoma County near me. Um, and these were in dry hillsides at Mission Dolores, and uh, Bear recorded these as early extirpations. Another early extirpation, probably because it was very, very localized, is leathery grape fern. For a bear, it was Batrichium ternatum. It was Batrichium until very recently here too. Now it's Skeptridium multifidum. Um, these, this is this is my um, gradual entry into the larger question of the um, mysteriously diverse <laughs> and unfamiliar wetland complexes that occurred between Mission Dolores, Upper Mission Creek and some of the other lowlands with creeks connecting to the bay. Um, uh, th there's some question, I, I can't, I'm not sure about the way he wrote his text, but either he was talking about the contrast with the formation that this occurred in um, as a local perennial dominated, sedge dominated uh, grassy vegetation, which is typical of the North Coast, uh, in the same breath, he was also talking about animal-dominated vegetation. I wasn't entirely sure whether he was suggesting this is in, in, from a, an original annual-dominated grassland or whether it was more of the sedge meadow association. Um, I actually can find Batrichia uh, scriptridium in both. It occurs in uh, annual grassland or, or a very dry coastal prairie in parts of Salt Point State Park, but it also typically occurs in sedge meadows uh, further north in Mendocino. So not entirely, you, you can read his reminiscences and judge for yourself. Um, another species that occurred almost uniquely like um, Skeptridium occurred in only one known locality in his time was Cornus nuttallii. Um, trees of San Francisco would deserve their own presentation. So I'm gonna skip a lot of cool stories here, but um, uh, in a fairly mesic uh, and somewhat shrubby area, again, at the border of this large wetland complex that extended from Mission Creek to Mission Dolores and, and little valleys uh, between high dune ridges that seemed to seep into them. Um, there was at least one tree of Cornus nuttallii, which he described as somewhat uh, scrubby. Um, and uh, it suggests to me that this may be a Pleistocene relic, an Ice Age relic of what was a former, more extensive um, mixed evergreen forest um, assemblage that was present but was already reduced by the, the late Holocene. It's, it's hard to have a reproductive population of um, mountain dogwood um, by itself. It's probably the reduced remnant of a much larger association that was formerly more extensive uh, during wetter, cooler periods, it may have been from the Pleistocene. Um, if you look in places like uh, Montana Mountain and um, uh, Point Reyes, you'll, you'll see isolated remnants of what appeared to be the understory of mixed evergreen to coniferous forest. And this, I suspect, was associated with those long lost formations. Here's, here's a view of um, arborescence or tree species. Um, uh, mountain dogwood, Cornus nuttallii, from uh, my area in uh, northwestern Sonoma County. They are they get to about um, sixty to seventy feet if they're lucky. <laughs> they're mo mostly uh, smaller trees. Another early native. Oh, I just got word that my internet connection's unstable, so I will 
Hang on. Uh, can I cut out my? I'm gonna. Oh, it's a start video. I guess I'm not on video. Um, uh, another early extirpation from San Francisco salt marshes, wetlands, was a species that Bear originally identified and named. Uh, his first published name for it, which has been partly resurrected, was Chloropyron palustri. We, most of us know it as um, Cordylanthus meridimus, or uh, subspecies palustris. Um, and it's been revised now to Chloropyrum, bear's name, Meridimum, subspecies Palustri. Um, this was present in the Mission Creek salt marsh complex, and also in Brandegee's time, it was present in a Visitation Bay. And he described the, the seaward or bayward end of that wetland complex, uh, grading down to a pickleweed flat, a salicornia flat, now sarcocornia, um, with patches of extensive uh, cordial, cordylanthus or, or salt marsh bird, the northern subspecies of salt marsh bird, bird's beak. Um, but this was interesting because it led to his description of a wetland gradient that included entirely freshwater species, some of which are associated with acid bogs. So the same wetland complex at one end is supporting chloropyrin, and at the other end is supporting Bog species. There's a. This is this is the probably the closest remnant population uh, near San Francisco. This is from Bethine Marsh in um, Richardson Bay, Marin County. So probably the closest relatives to uh, the San Francisco Bay populations are actually having. Well, this year is a terrible year. <laughs> They're almost all gone. But the seed bank has been expanding for some decades. So we still have the opportunity to reintroduce. Um, uh, salt marsh birds beak to San Francisco Bay tidal marshes um, once we have suitable high marsh habitat. Another early extirpation is somewhat ambiguous. I'm going out a limb here. Um, I think I've already pointed out that I'm suspicious of Hans Baer's um, interest and skill <laughs> with sedges and grasses. And frankly, uh, the botany of California, 1880, by modern standards, even today, <laughs> uh, kerases were a mess. Um, they were very ambiguous. They were probably there were synonyms and species lumped together. So it's really hard to sort out what they meant by some of the names they used in the 1880s. But I suspect based on the locality and some of the partial synonyms, um, and I'm open to being corrected on this. Uh, unfortunately, there are no specimens to really adjudicate what this was, I suspect that the Presidio location of what Bear was calling Carex paniculata was probably from the brackish to fresh water end of the tidally choked Presidio marsh, which is now associated with Chrissy Field. Um, it was rather like the marshes I'll be showing you at, from Mission Creek, where the upper end of it was associated with a lot of species that are strictly fresh water. And this was probably in some intermediate transition zone that was brackish. I think it was um, uh, Carex lingbii, uh, which does occur uh, all through Mendocino estuaries. There's a small population in Lagunitas Creek's tidal reach in Tamales Bay. There is um, an intermediate population in Sassoon Marsh that has not been well characterized. And there's an outlier even down in the Carmel River in Monterey. And I expect that um, there are some old localities down near Alviso and a few other places in San Francisco Bay that were brackish tidal marshes that had, um, again, these ambiguous old abandoned taxa. I think one was in San Francisco. So I think we had uh, very likely weekly tidal marshes that were brackish that had Eric's lingbii. But this one is a soft ID, <laughs> no specimens. And here's a view of the 1850s um, uh, topography of the, of the Presidio Marsh. There are two, two wings to it, but this is approximately where Chrissy Field to Black Point and the marina is now. This is much, much larger than Chrissy Field's tiny little um, spit and marsh. Um, but you can see the, the um, left side, the east, the western end is somewhat attenuated from the tides. And there's a lot of serpentine 
hill slopes draining into it with groundwater discharges, just like today. And the species that were listed from the Presidio Marsh include a, a rich assemblage of freshwater marsh species. And I suspect this was uh, found somewhere in this complex between fresh, brackish, and saltwater marsh. Another uh, Presidio aquatic species, freshwater, that was an early extirpation was um, uh, Marsilia vestida, which is a water clover. Um, they look, they look like clovers. It's a water fern, really. Um, and it was already extinct by 1888. Um, you can find these in vernal pools, uh, usually deeper vernal pools that stay wet for months, um, and also lake shores, but mostly in nutrient poor areas, not rich, muddy soils with lots of, you know, cattails that would outcompete them. They're really humble, prostrate species, as you can tell by their vernal pool affinity. And I think I have, a, I have an advanced guess. I won't even call it a hypothesis of where this might have been. Um, and it goes back to Menzies' journal, 1792. Um, Menzies was looking for fresh water. He was entering the port before there was, you know, a, a presidio at all <laughs> that, uh, that was developed near the shore. They were looking for freshwater sources for their ships, and they described what they found. Um, they described a, um, no streams for fresh water, but they described a standing pond. This is in the, in the reach describing the uh, entrance to San Francisco Bay, which I believe is Point Fort Point. His other descriptions conform with Bear's descriptions of the Bay Laurel and Bellularia fringe. Um, and he said there was a pond behind the beach, which was fresh water. Well, you can see this early version of the 1851 US Coast Survey map. There's sort of a looped barrier beach that closes off and is pretty disconnected from the tidal sloughs that go to the Presidio Marsh. There's no channel connections and there's heavy seepage. You, you know Fort Point today is heavy duty freshwater seeps. And this was of course the late little ice age. This was a 300 year period before the 20th century which was some of the wettest heaviest rainfall in the last, well, in the late Holocene. So it was an anomalously cool and wet period. So I bet those serpentine seeps were just pouring out. And that would explain why this pond was fresh water rather than brackish. And um, at the same time uh, of Menzies, early explorers to um, what's now Sassoon Bay, Sassoon Marsh, it, its former name was Freshwater Bay. So that tells you how much freshwater discharge was going into the estuary and how brackish to fresh parts of it were. were. So anyway, that's my, my best guess about where Marsilia was. Well, now I'm gonna uh, breach into the, what um, uh, Bear wrote a lot about. It, it's sort of discursive wandering writing, so it's hard to get a hold on it. I'll try to make it more systematic, but he described what I believe is an oligotrophic fen. Fens are, uh, nutrient poor peatland wetlands. And some of his descriptions really make it clear that he was looking at peatlands. And the species assemblages all are associated with what he described as bogs. Bogs has a narrower definition today, um, but uh, open flowing water systems on peaty soils with acid loving or uh, nutrient poor associated species that were continuous with marshes. You probably read ahead to the text. He described as a turfy water, fresh water formation, no ambiguity there, gradually merging to the Salicornia flat. So I'm not going out on the limb here. He's describing a fresh water wetland grading into salty pickleweed marshes. And crossed by the serpentine courses, by serpentine, of course, he does not mean the uh, lithology <laughs> serpentine. He, he's referring to the highly sinuous tidal creeks of salt marshes. Um, and he's desc actually describing the transition between sedge dominated meadows, which is still the case today. And if you go up in the North Coast and look at our estuaries up here, grade in from, from uh, freshwater sedge cypressae dominated marshes affected only by most extreme tides down to brackish and then finally salt marshes. So this association is widespread in North Coast estuaries and coastal lagoons. And here is what I think 
is what he, one of the closest analogs I can think of that he was describing. He referred to a, um, uh, uh, a kind of Arctic oasis amid a vegetation of the California type. A lot of the species he found in these wetlands were typical of Canadian, Alaskan, and Pacific Northwest peatlands. He actually described um, the center of the, the, peat, the peatland as being topographically higher than the edges near the steep dune ridges, the linear dune ridges that bounded them. Well, that is typical of a kind of a raised bog or a raised fen where differential peat accretion actually raises the topography of um, the center of the wetland. That's typical raised bog or raised fen. Now we call them fens. Um, anyway, uh, this is an example of what I think is similar. This is the, the back of 10 Mile Dunes, which is part of McCarricker State Park. This is actually just outside the park um, in uh, north of Fort Bragg. It's near Cleone uh, to Inglenook in Mendocino County. And it's a high mobile dune ridge that has no internal drainage because streams don't really form in dunes. The infiltration of rainfall, and it is heavy rainfall up here, um, goes directly, it, it infiltrates faster than it can run off. So that means that any wetland next to a dune is being um, fed mostly by subsurface discharge. In other words, groundwater discharges are much more important than surface discharges for wetlands adjacent to dune systems. And I think this is not only indicative of this particular acid peaty sedge dominated fen with a lot of decadent um, wetland forest behind it, but I think it was also the case in San Francisco where we saw these bog formations. They were in Bear's explicit descriptions of arms or valleys between unusually high old dune ridges. And again, that's consistent because the, the Eastern San Francisco dunes were not modern. They didn't have shell fragments in them with extra calcium. Um, these were either Pleistocene, Ice Age, or early Holocene dunes associated with earlier lower sea levels. These are very old dunes like the ones out at your Buena Island. They have had millennia to lose all of their, their um, base associated nutrients like calcium. So the water that leaches out of these old dunes is probably very acidic. Well, here's a, a bird's eye view, of some very well delineated um, topography and kind of symbolic vegetation, which is coarse, but close enough to get a view of what Bear was seeing. This is just, um, I'm just focusing on a few different areas. Here you can see the mouth of Mission Creek, clearly a tidal marsh with a, there's a little, uh, I don't, you can't see my cursor, I bet, but um, there's a little tiny drowned hill, probably a dune hill in the marsh. That's a rare thing. So there are tidal sinuous creeks, what Bear called his serpentine creeks. This is probably tidal salt marsh. You can see there's kind of a constriction of that slough. That constriction probably is one of the transition zones between that buildup of massive, freshwater discharge into the wetland complex. Again, this is probably a drowned valley. By drowned, I mean sea level rise 300 feet between 9,000 years ago and present. And much of that, um, you know, last few meters is in the last few thousand years. So this is probably an old freshwater fen that became gradually encroached by tidal marsh, tidal salt marsh as sea level rose, but the earlier and older vegetation was probably this bog-like fen. And here's Mission Dolores. You can see some large ponds which have apparently surface water connection tides, but it's very unlikely that this is saline water based on what species we found there. We'll go back to that and I'll go forward. Uh, you can see there are also some other drowned valley formations between dune ridges um, that have no channels at all. They are flat. And I believe these are also what, um, I won't go into the exact details of Bear's locations. That's kind of more history and geography. But I suspect that these were large commons of freshwater thin vegetation at their upper or landward ends to the west and their seaward um, 
uh, tidal, tidal ends. So that's a view of one of the other formations. This is going into what's now downtown San Francisco. This is the mission. And think of this uh, where you see those horizontal hatching lines, which refers to, I will say tidal marsh, but also tidally connected coastal marshes that aren't strictly tidal. Those are flats. So everywhere you know in the mission that's flat, there you are. <laughs> that's, that topography is the outline of where these marshes were. Here's a zoomed in example. You can see how steep and high those dune ridges were. These are, again, think of how much water they absorb. There are no surface drainages. They're just pouring water in through groundwater to the edges of these wetlands. You can see there's a little sand spit by Steamboat Point. Long gone. Here's a, an interesting picture that was mapped. Look at how the sloughs kind of widen into this large lagoon. Uh, we'll look at some botanical indicators of whether this was fresh water or whether it was extremely acid fresh water versus brackish or, or saline. And also notice that the US Coast Survey map illustrators drew in where there was woodland thickets. And this is exactly what um, Bear was describing. You can see it all along the edge of the, the lower edge of the dunes. And by the way, that corresponds pretty precisely with what you see on North Coast and Mile Dunes. Um, here's a view from late 1850s. You can see how rapidly cultivation has spread in less than seven years. So you're, you're actually seeing what Bear watched go in the space of a decade. So this is the later version of the 1850s US Coast Survey map. And you can see all of those um, flatlands were rapidly turned into roads and urbanized areas, agriculture first, and then urban. It's the same succession as today. But the remnants of the lagoons and the sloughs are still there. They're just bridged and roaded and probably culverted. Well, here's what was in some of those, back to botany. Um, <laughs> Long lost species for San Francisco, I believe, unless someone knows where those are the currents. Cicuta californica in Bear's flora. This is probably Cicuta douglasii. Bear was aware of Cicuta bolandari of Sassoon Marsh, but also uh, it's called Sassoon uh, water hemlock, but it actually did occur in Alviso and um, East Bay, a few places in brackish marshes. It was in several places in San Francisco, including Upper Mission Creek and that Mission Dolores Fen. And it was also found in the Presidio marshes. Uh, Bear went on described how eagerly cattle would eat the uh, largely or nanny sarmentota and would leave this alone. Of course, this is highly toxic to um, livestock, but livestock weren't dumb. They avoided this like plague. And you can still find this. this, is, this is, these photos are from Schooner uh, uh, Bay and Point Reyes in Upper Drake's Bay at the edge of a tidal marsh. Um, this, oops, sorry, typo, didn't get. Um, this same area that supported Cicuta also has another extirpated species, um, Biden's Livus uh, in Bear's flora, Biden's Chrysanthemoides. Um, these are currently present in parts of the Delta, usually in nutrient poor older peaty marshes rather than any of the recent marshes that we move around. There's um, a broader view of the association between sedge dominated vegetation, in this case, uh, Scirpus. Necrocarpus uh, at the freshwater seepy edge of those acidic sandstone edges in Upper Schooner Bay in Drake's Estero um, about 10 years ago. Doesn't look like that this year. <laughs> Groundwater is kind of given out. Beautiful flowers. Um, if, if we do restore brackish to fresh transitions anywhere in the Presidio, this would be maybe it's they're, they're kind of. A, on top of all that, the Presidio these days, maybe it's already been introduced, but this would be a great component. Another really strong indicator of the acid bog conditions in uh, some of these open water areas in, in uh, Mission Dolores Comp uh, Mission Creek Complex is uh, Nufar Polycipola. And this, these are photos from Inglenook Fen, which is a highly acidic fen pond. Um, it was present in Mountain Lake. It was in the so-called swamp, uh, the, the fen complex, associated with all these species. So we know that if there was, this is an open water dependent species. It does not grow in solid emergent marsh. So when I looked at those interior Mission Dolores pools, I'm pretty sure that these were not saline or brackish areas. This is no salinity tolerance whatsoever. And if you needed to hammer that point in a little more, 
Bears 1888 uh, flora also included a locality of Potamogeton Illinoensis, uh, as then he, he listed it as Potamogeton lucens. That is a Sierran cold water mountain lake pondweed. It grows in deep cold water. There are a few examples in some deep lakes in Sonoma County. There's, I think they're in the um, uh, Crystal Lake down in the peninsula and the Fault Lakes there. But this is uh, a clear indicator that there were freshwater lakes or lagoons that were directly connected to that Mission Creek tidal complex. Well, here's what they might have looked like. This is the closest analog I can I can show you today. Well, not today. <laughs> this is probably drained down quite a bit this year. But this is um, a large uh, fen lake or pond in um, Mendocino County at Inglenook Fen. Uh, the edge you can see here is mostly Nufar polysepala, but there's also another species. Um, I'll show you next. This is uh, the mouth of that fen. You can see large floating aquatic there um, associated with willow and sedge and uh, Morella californica or Mirica californica wax myrtle. Here's another view of that same fen pond complex. Here you see the, the uh, lower edge of what is uh, Scinoplectus uh, acutus, uh, tall tule. Uh, that's basically a floating mat. It's not solid ground. That is a floating mat marsh, very much like what you see at the back of Rodeo Lagoon above the culvert where it's a floating mat marsh. Uh, the outer edge there is Menianthes trifoliata, which is primarily a boreal you know, Alaska, British Columbia species. Um, it, it's very rare even in Mendocino County. This is also, I, I expect, uh, what um, Bear meant by Arctic refuges or li like little Arctic islands. Um, these are probably Pleistocene relic species that are hanging out in some of the wettest, coldest, most nutrient poor acidic wetlands that were remaining after, um, after the post-glacial climate took over. Uh, here is, uh, I couldn't, you can't really walk out to the buck bean because you, you need to either paddle out there or you sink up to your chest, <laughs> I can't get out. So that's a telephoto lens, sorry, I have to go any photo. But they associate uh, with these, you know, partly emergent to ponded areas, uh, depending on how much um, groundwater fills that pond. This is also Inglewood Fen. Here's another view from a, a hidden lake. I brought this up. Um, this is a um, hidden lake in, in uh, the Ten Mile Dunes complex. Note the reason I brought this um, to, to focus is because of the analogy with multiple ponds that occur on high ridges in San Francisco, or occurred, some of them still occur like Mountain Lake, but are impounded or dammed by high old stabilized dune ridges. Can you see the, well, of course you can see those snags. Those are the tops of forest trees. Some of them are redwoods, most of them are um, Pinus miricata, but that's the top of a tree growing out of a marsh. What that shows is dune transgression or landward migration of dunes that halted, stabilized, formed pine forest, and then advanced again and killed the pine forest and moved the um, impoundment zone a little further landward. And you can see that, that the area behind it filled in with new forest that's ponded for a lot of the year. This is analogous with um, a lot of the lagunas you see perched in the interior of San Francisco. We have a series of dune lakes. Mountain Lake is the best known. There's a whole historical series. I won't go into the geography, um, but they all have associated with them some of the same species we find at Inglenook Fen and also Hunter's Lagoon and Manchester Point Arena, um, uh, including Hippurus vulgaris, which is also a boreal species. I'll show you a photo and, and more of that Nufar. Here's an association between Nufar and Hippurus vulgaris, uh, mare's tail, pretty uncommon wetland plant, it used to be at Mountain Lake and Lobos Creek. Um, and here it's growing in a drawn down um, dune dammed pond, Hidden Lake in Mendocino. Going out into the fen areas that Bear explored, these would be around these open water areas where the peats had accumulated and uh, maintained, again, groundwater discharges only. Um, rare species we associate with peatlands on the North Coast all the way to Alaska, Melianthes, 
but also Epipactis gigantea, which we find in riparian areas in uh, the North Coast, mostly on exposed roots of sedges or occasionally on willows, but they, they are root mat colonizers. And uh, a beautiful scented orchid um, uh, that used to occur in a few localities in San Francisco. Uh, it was formerly Habenaria leucostachus. Now it's in the Plantantheras. And um, he described, and here's an example of what I think is the closest analogous uh, peat land. There's a peaty back dune area uh, at the upper end of um, uh, Drake Sestero near Bull Point. And there is a continuous peatland with a lot of Sierran species and riparian species we associate mostly with the North Coast, but also in this PD matrix are beautiful stands of Epipactis, which I bet are directly analogous with the San Francisco examples. Another peatland species, this one has more Southern affinities um, in San Francisco and also Flaco Lake and a few other places uh, is Ar Arenaria paludicola. Marsh sandwort. I believe this has been reintroduced to parts of GGNRA. Um, was in um, uh, at least two points, uh, Presidio and and uh, uh, the the Mission Mission Creek complex uh, peatlands. Uh, it's hard to keep going. It's a sort of a gap colonizer. It's associated with sedge and rush vegetation, and uh, it's a very sensitive to drought. So I'm not sure how successful our future um, reintroductions will be in this area unless we find some really strong, consistent groundwater areas. Um, here is a view of uh, Platanthera dilatata variety of Lucostachis, uh, bears habenaria, uh, early extinction because it was from that um, same Mission Creek complex fen. Uh, this is the example of that PD fan above uh, uh, Bull Point in Drake's Estero. It's associated with a rich assemblage of species with a lot of overlap. Well, that is my <laughs> breathless tour through uh, Hans Baer's condensed reminiscences from my biased North Coast perspective. Um, I really would encourage you to um, look at a few of the, the um, biographical papers uh, on Hans Baer. Uh, he, he had a rich life. I've done him no justice. I've just delved into a bit of his botany. If I were an entomologist, I could probably do um, a couple talks on his entomology as well. Um, he was a real, I mean, he was a template for many of the artistic, intellectual, progressive San Franciscans that came over a century later. And um, we, we owe him a tremendous amount. And I, I have not wasted my time reading and rereading his um, very terse flora and all of his obscure publications in the Proceedings of Cal Academy of Sciences, which are now um, found online as PDFs. So I've at it. Thank you. I think that's it. Far out. Peter, you still there? I'm there. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Okay, hey, well, uh, I went uh, kind of over, not too much. I think. No, 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 it fires the imagination there. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't cover a lot. I took out slides, of course. I'm amazed I, I was able to finish within an hour, but um, there are lots of other mysteries and ambiguities and fascinating interpretations. My talk is not definitive. Um, these are, you know, my best guesses and best inferences. Um, so I really want to encourage people to go into his <laughs> writings and form your own opinions. I'd love to get feedback on anything I said, and I'll stand corrected if I've missed uh, missed some points. Very cool, man. Well, there's. Uh, do you do you have uh, time and energy to answer a few questions in the oh, Q and A? Sure. Yeah, I'd also like to know if any uh, botanist historically like Bear approached uh, had any kind of sadness about progress as that was coming or if it was just like, oh, yeah, this is just the way it is. And this is what happens. Or were they going, oh, we got to save this stuff. I, I think, um, well, if you look at um, Bear's comments on what happened to Native people in the Philippines um, and <laughs> Australia, you can see he had sentiments and ethical principles very closely comparable with 
modern San Francisco liberal culture, <laughs> um, I say that without irony and without disrespect. Um, no, I think it did bother him a lot, but he also saw how rapid and inexorable the change was. So I don't think there was any thought. I think his his duty is actually, um, I think it's somewhat similar to my own views. Like I feel like my, sometimes when I can't really save something or restore it or help it much, the least I can do is witness it. And I think he was bearing witness to something and he really worked hard at that. Um, I, I, I'm sure there was a great deal of sadness, um, particularly, you know, you look at the dates he wrote these reminiscences um, and you can even see the introduction. He said, I am, I'll paraphrase, but he said, I'm, you know, one of the last and, and ever shortening list of people who were here during the early days of San Francisco who can remember this. And I think he was, as he was nearing the end of his life, and he was, he died, um, oh gosh, not long after he wrote those reminiscences. I think he really wanted to leave that legacy because some of the arguments he had with people about what was native and non-native, I think he was perplexed by, you know, how short their memories were. And it really was his his obligation to give a sense of what was there. It certainly helped me. Um, you know, I don't think he got out like Bullinger did to see other parts of um, the coast north of it. So I think he was a little bit more insular, even though he was a world traveler. Um, so what he saw being lost in San Francisco, he didn't comment on, you know, other places in California that had things that were similar. Um, so yeah, I think he probably felt like this is the last of the last. And that's why I'm I'm kind of pointing to maybe these have distant relatives elsewhere. Um, anyway, cool. Well, there's some uh, there's a few really good questions in the uh, in the Q and A. But do you want to uh, take a look at those? And... Sure. Oh, there's Q and A. Right. Okay. Can you opine on how similar native flora was at Lake? Oh, Lake Merced. Yeah, Lake Merced. Um, it has its own flora, so it has some species that are not shared with wetlands elsewhere, but it also has a lot of shared species. In many ways, Lake Merced is more similar to Laguna Salada, um, which though its name says Salada, which means salty, it also has a number of species that are obligate freshwater wetland species. I think what they all have in common with the early historic Rodeo Lagoon and a lot of North Coast closed lagoons is that they have that polarity between landward, freshwater dominated, groundwater dominated, or stream dominated freshwater inflows, transition zones that are brackish, and outer zones that are fluctuating in salinity based on when they breach or overwash or get overfilled above tide levels with fresh water. The, uh, ex the difference with, with um, Lake Merced is that it graded into um, coma formation. So it's, it, it's growing on these Pliocene uh, sandy terraces. So very different terrestrial connections. And there are a number, yeah, there's a number of different distinct assemblages around Lake Merced, but they also have the, the wetland flora has a lot of similarities. Um, I don't believe Lake Merced has the same complement of fen, of oligotrophic, you know, those acid loving boggy fen species. Did Bear make collections? I think most of the interesting stuff that I, um, I described are only referenced by citation of Bear's lists. Um, he did work for Cal Academy, but don't forget Cal Academy's collections before the 1906, am I getting the year right? Six, the, the earthquake that destroyed most of the specimens probably took all of whatever Bear had collected. You know, Alice, there's that wonderful anecdote about Alice Eastwood running into the burning building and saving armfuls of specimens. I don't, think a lot of bear stuff came through, but all the stuff I've seen cited are from his flora. So the documentary collections are probably the majority. And I wish there were specimens of his sedges because <laughs> they're, they're uh, um, confounding. Some may be in other herbaria, like some of his stuff may be in Harvard. Um, some of the early botanical collections from San Francisco are, you know, some of them are in Russia, <laughs> they're all over. And uh, the, Ca the California Consortium of Herbaria sometimes doesn't get to all of them. Uh, can Peter speak to the application of his historical ecology to current restoration projects? 
Sure. Um, one thing I'll start on a sober note about restoration. You know, when I, I started working on uh, recovery plans for endangered species in San Francisco, you know, I, re <laughs> I really had uh, a lot of hope that some of these very persistent refuges that are based on, you know, eternal geology, serpentine and hard rock hydrology, like serpentine seeps, I thought, you know, those are things that did survive the transition between the Ice Age and the Holocene, which had, you know, you know the Holocene history, but we've had a lot of hot periods um, in the Holocene that, you know, were kind of similar to what we're experiencing now, uh, if not worse than the last few <laughs> years, that lasted centuries of extreme droughts and hot periods when, you know, redwood forests weren't here, really. They were minor assemblages, they were pine and oak, and you know we've had huge climate fluctuations. And I think our restoration uh, ambitions were based on our legacies from botanical collections during a little ice age. So I've scaled back some of my hopes that we can extend the little ice age, you know, the, the tail end of the little ice age into the Anthropocene. Um, in some cases, serpentine species, probably, yeah. And with some dune species, probably yes. But these boreal remnants, I think it's it's like an old soil or uh, an archeological remnant. You may be able to maintain what you have, but putting them back together after they've been disassembled in a new climate regime, starting from scratch, I don't think we're gonna be building any peatlands in San Francisco, um, no matter how good the seeps are we may be able to find analogous functional equivalents that support some of the species, but not the ecosystems in all cases. So yeah, I think we will probably try to reassemble functional equivalents much reduced of some of the, the things that Bear saw, but they are irretrievable losses in many cases. That's that's why I thought they were so cool. <laughs> they're they're uh, you know they were massive and nothing like them anywhere left in the central coast. Um, but we have a peek into what they may have been like, and we probably can see what other similar habitats they could be in in a small scale. And I think we can reach for those. There's some restorations right now, and you know uh, Presidio and and particularly Mountain Lake and maybe the Serpentine Seeps near Fort Point, where you know homes for these might be found, but certainly not the original. William Hammond Hall, first and two superintendent, uh, worked on stabilizing dunes. Uh, McLaren, okay, if you read McLaren's memoir from 1929, he, he may have become superintendent around 1890, but I guess he claimed to be the guy on the ground working with the military. Um, I'm not sure who really claims credit for the military. Um, work in the Presidio, whether they got Amofla first or the blame for Amofla, or whether it was McLaren. Um, McLaren described an account where they actually imported seeds from the Gascony coast of France, which suggests that our subspecies of Amofla, it's not really recognized now, was subspecies Arundinacea, which is equivalent to some of the older names for Amofla. It's the southern, it used to be a different species uh, on the southern coast of Europe. And uh, he specified that they came from the Gascony coast. So I suspect that he either knew who was importing them or they were imported from the park. I've heard other accounts that may not be exclusive that we got our mafla from Australia because they introduced it there for the same purposes. They had more dunes. Um, and of course we got a lot of stuff from Australia but it's not clear which came first. There may have been multiple introductions uh, but I don't think he did it when he was superintendent. I think he was doing it when he was um, the guy on the ground. Let's see what else we got. But I'll, I'll stand corrected on that. If there is better documentary sources that the main one I rely on is McLaren's uh, 1929 text. I think it's called, it's a weird title, like Plant and Garden or Flower and Garden. It's just like his, his memoirs from his career. And he may have been, you know, self-promoting. I don't know. Oh, bush lupin, I better not go on too long. Yellow bush lupin is in fact not native to San Francisco and it did not come from the North Coast. It was introduced to the North Coast. Very clear, the 1863 Proceedings of California Academy of Sciences have a wonderful paper by Henry Bolander, 
um, which is, uh, what is it called? An invent, is it inventory of the shrubs and trees of the, I uh, can't remember the exact title, but the Bay Area, but you can get it. It's the PDFs available now. Um, I used to have to actually go into the collections at Cal Academy and copy by hand or photocopy, but he made a list of all woody species he found from uh, to really the south end of Tamales Bay, which, you know, his area covered Point Reyes. And the short of it is the synonym at the time in Bot Botany of California, 1860s to 1880s uh, of Lupinus arboreus was Lupinus macrocarpus. And he describes its range as Sacramento River and South. So San Francisco Bay, but in the South. And the habitat was I, I may not be getting it exactly verbatim, but pretty darn close. Um, gra runs, ru he described them as runs. I think he meant gulches uh, to, of the bay. He's referring to the bay where the substrate or the ground or the soil partakes of a clay nature. That is surprising. And it is the same species. If you look at the central coast distribution of Lupinus arboreus, it's not really in dunes like it is in San Francisco. The clue to how we got it is actually in McLaren, his 1929 memoir. It was part of a successional planting of Ammophila stabilization. There was a plan. First two years, you stabilize with Ammophila. When the sand sits still, you oversow it with yellow bush lupin, which McLaren described as native to this sector not the coast. If you look at the historic herbarium collections of Lupinus arboreus, you won't really find them before 1880. Um, there is one ambiguous Russian collection from before there were geographic names in California. That was an era when, uh, in, the, in the Russian era, the point of dispatch was where if a, a herbarium specimen had a locality. It was the port where it was sent out from, not the area it was collected from because there were no place names. So there was one Porto Bodega or Little Bodega that has a specimen associated with it with uh, Lupinus arboreus. I think it could have been collected anywhere between Monterey and Bodega. That happened to be where they made the dispatch to send the specimens out. Um, if you look at the 1939, sorry, I'm going on too long. <laughs> if you go to the 1939 uh, assessment by William Cooper, great botanist and geologist, uh, of the flora of the Strand of California, he said Arboreus is not really a member of the dune community. And he's really, he, he's the best traveled botanist and ge geomorphologist of the last century. And he was working at the turn of the last century, 1900 to 1920s, a little bit after that, he moved out of here. He made it really clear. It was not really a member of, of the coast. If you read Cooper and you read uh, McLaren, it's pretty clear it was a successful introduction to San Francisco. And once they got the method down, it was replicated all through the North Coast. There's a paper, uh, I think it's from Adia, um, maybe uh, by uh, Miller, I can't remember his last name, about how it got to Humboldt. And where there was some dispute was between San Francisco and Marin. And I, I am satisfied that it was an introduction north of San Francisco. Um, and it was specifically associated with Ammophila. I think there is clear facilitation of Ammophila and Lupinus arboreus. Even where arboreus hybridizes, as it does in Mendocino, it only invades abundantly as co-dominant where there's Ammophila stabilization. It actually has a hard time uh, invading into natural dune scrub in Mendocino, which is really surprising. So I, there is some kind of either microbial or other kind of facilitation specific to Ammophila stabilized dunes. I went on too long, but you asked a <laughs> really, really um, loaded question for me. I've been working on that one for decades. Did I lose you all? <laughs> no, we're still here. We're okay. Still here. Sorry, I was breathless with that one. That was that was. Yeah, a question, yeah, question. yeah. No. <laughs> we're, we're we're discussing in the background. <laughs> no, thank you. If you, you travel down, go, go down the coast, um, you know, away from Mofala dunes, like Morro Bay. I mean, central coast, there's Lupinus arboreus. There's lots of it on the terraces. But go into the stabilized, the naturally stabilized dunes, dune scrub in Morro Bay. You, you, I'll tell you where you'll find arboreus. It grows in seeps in bluffs, in sandy Pleistocene dune bluffs. 
south of like Hazard Canyon, uh, south of Shark Inlet, and not in the main dunes. And if you go into other central coast dunes, Monterey Bay, like eh, areas that have been disturbed or had homophila, but may, the main dunes, it's just not an invasive species there. And th there's no question that Bolander was describing Lupinus albifrons, which they, they used to merge Chamasonis and albifrons. And he was describing that as abundant in dunes. So he was, he was looking at dune lupins. And the same guy that was looking at dune lupins, and the same people that wrote Botany of California, they saw both species and they only described one from dunes <laughs> before Amophila. Cool. Yeah. Well, hey, Peter, thanks so much, man. This has been really, really entertaining. Thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> there, it, was, it was a real pleasure, man. Okay. And, uh, and we hope you'll come back again. All right. Be happy to talk to you. I guess I'll close out now. Yeah, I suppose so. It's okay. yeah, it's getting it's getting the witching hour for a lot yep. of people. I <laughs> bet it is after <laughs> nonstop. Okay, thanks. I Bye. know you guys party hardy up there in Mendocino. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night. No, thanks so much. And hey, everybody, uh, join us on October 14th uh, for Sarah Jacobs, who will be doing uh, presenting on her paintbrush Castilleja research. Thanks again, Peter. Bye-bye, everybody.